Thank you. In the summer of 2017, when I was navigating my third round of multiple brain tumors in as many years, my then seven-year-old daughter asked me why I suddenly needed a walking stick to get around. I've lost my balance, darling. I tried to explain, not really knowing how, to which she replied with great enthusiasm, I bet I can find it. I'm the best looker in this family. <laughs> and there it was, that deep-seated, indefatigable urge to retrieve or hold onto what's been lost. In that moment, I shared the urge. All my faculties were under threat again, and no alternative to whole brain radiotherapy, which posed a different version of the same threat, had surfaced in the months since these tumors were discovered. By now, I had lost my ability to drive, to scoop my child into my arms, bend down and kiss her goodnight, walk unaided in the garden and go to a shop independently. I was even beginning to lose some words, those cherished conductors through which my spirit flows most freely into the world. Slowly but surely, I was losing precious pieces of myself. The cancer patient community in which I've been immersed since my incurable diagnosis in 2014 is a world of profuse loss. Mostly in our shared vulnerability, deep bonds form fast. We don't have time to buffer love with caution or politeness, so we move into each other's hearts, despite the clear risk of losing each other. As a high-profile patient activist, I'm in touch with thousands of patients around the world, and I've lost count of the deaths I know about, let alone the ones I don't. In less than two years, cancer took nine people I truly loved from me, including my father. Three people in my support group died between Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve and another one just yesterday. We drop like leaves from trees, not only as winter draws in, but in every season. These deaths, felt most keenly by the families left behind, are the ultimate but not the only losses. As patients, there's all we might lose if we don't make it, and all we will lose even if we do. We lose our hair, our ability to work, income, relationships, energy, vitality, dignity, independence, time with our kids, the right to travel insurance and mortgages, and all too often, the futures we had dreamed of or taken for granted. At different points along the way, I have lost many, but not all these things. <laughs> the landscape of loss has been magnified for me by cancer, but it belongs to us all. It's as inescapable as nightfall. We lose jobs, marriages, friendships, loved ones, health, appetites, memories, sleep, direction, control, collagen, which I was actually far more prepared for than the somewhat horrifying acquisition of facial hair. <laughs> Just saying. Um, yeah. um, we're designed for loss, peeps. Just like flowers are designed to lose petals, but in our culture, we're not prepared for it. We're taught how to achieve and gain, but rarely how to relinquish and let go. Nor are we taught well how to grieve. The most notable and widely accepted template of grief in Western culture is the Kubler-Ross grief cycle which depicts five distinct phases of grief people go through when they experience a significant loss. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Now, I don't doubt that these accurately represent many people's reactions to loss, and I've witnessed this close up, especially 
especially with parents facing the death of a child, a loss that outruns all others by many miles. But here's the thing. In my experience and in my work with hundreds of clients since my diagnosis, grief, by which I mean knee buckling, chest cracking, tear streaming sorrow, does not feature in the grief cycle at all. Denial is not grief, it's denial. It's a refusal to believe the losses that seem too hard to bear, a temporary shock absorber that returns reality to sender and makes us numb. Anger is not grief, it's anger. It insists this loss is not right, not fair, should not be happening. It lays blame, finds fault, calls God an asshole, and clings with tight fists to illusions of power and control. Bargaining is not grief. It's bargaining. It's where anger and denial join forces to try and talk God, life, or whatever the hell is out there into giving back what's been taken. Depression is not grief, it's depression. It's where anger and bargaining collapse with exhaustion. Instead of denying our sorrow, we depress it, pushing it down like a lead weight that tethers the spirit. At all these stages, grief is actually locked out. I'm tempted to rename it the resist grief with all your might cycle. And of course we resist. Perhaps the only agony that surpasses grief is that of staying stuck in a numbed out, enraged, soul-destroying inability to release what we've lost. As I have witnessed numerous times with friends and clients, sorrow passes through the gateway of acceptance of yes, this is really happening, however deeply I wish it wasn't. Sorrow opens the heart that anger closes. It releases the tears that depression swallows. It surrenders to what, to what cannot be bargained with. It melts the freeze. Acceptance is not where we find so-called completion or peace. It's where we begin to let grief have its way with us and give way to its harrowing but ultimately transformative pain. Even in the brilliant Disney Pixar film Inside Out, in which the characters are all emotions inside a girl called Riley's head, spoiler alert, <laughs> it is sadness who saves the day. Sadness is the most rejected emotion in the film, the one it's not okay for Riley to feel, and who seems to serve no purpose, reflecting a culture of relentless positivity. But it's only when sadness takes over and Riley bursts into tears that her turmoil ends. I believe we have done grief a great injustice. Until I was told I had stage four lung cancer, I too had mistaken it for what it isn't and reserved it for the shattering losses like the death of my beloved spiritual mentor and suicide of my very dear friend. At first, it was the almost unspeakable sorrow I felt at the still very real prospect of leaving my longed for daughter, whose fifth birthday I was told I might not see, that broke the dam. It bent me double. <clears throat> I cried inconsolably for many weeks. It was like a tsunami I had no control over. I was utterly heartbroken for her, for me for my darling husband. More surprising, though, were the sorrows carried by the smaller waves that followed. I felt grief for a catalogue of 
failures, disappointments, and regrets for studies I hadn't completed, books I hadn't written, careers I hadn't pursued, friendships I hadn't maintained, truths I hadn't told. I felt grief for everything I wished I'd done that I hadn't, and everything I had done that I wished I hadn't. I felt grief for wasted time, wasted talent, wasted love for every way I had fail to shine my light into the world or simply let someone sit with me in the darkness. Grief looked for all the places I left myself behind and said sorry. And thus it brought me back home. Even when I was dying, when my vision, language and mobility were failing, I became more myself, not less. Merciless as it was, grief banished the bullshit. It showed me what mattered most. It reminded me that my terminal condition is everyone's condition and washed self-pity away. It made me more loving, forgiving, grateful, boundaried, feisty, authentic which was everything I had long strived for <clears throat> and most wanted to gain. I later learned that according to Chinese medicine, grief is held in the lungs and wondered how much clogged up sorrow was embedded in my primary tumor. I also learned that inspiration belongs to the lungs. They coexist, perhaps even need each other, because far from shutting us down, grief, which I define as the courageous expression of sorrow, opens us up like love. For me, it was emotional oxygen that helped me breathe again, almost literally, though I did need medical treatment for that too. <laughs> and as my life force returned, it inspired me to blog, write books, support fellow patients, work with clients on their grief, walk taller with the giver shits, and give a TEDx talk about <laughs> how to win when we lose. <clears throat> I thought this might be a snotty talk. <laughs> <clears throat> if loss is inescapable, then how can we be expanded by it instead of diminished? By letting grief walk us across the bridge, from the life we planned or expected to the life we're actually given, the one riddled with letdowns, life shocks, and tragedies. By assigning sadness to our failures, disappointments, and lesser losses, instead of reserving it for the epic ones, which just makes our darkest hours darker. By feeling and expressing sorrow, however gut-wrenching, because it's, it's the only part of us that knows how to let go. And when we do this, grief brings what we've lost back to us in mysterious ways. It keeps love alive and it holds lost loves close. It reveals the astonishing light that awaits us in the heart of darkness. It didn't so much bring me back to life as bring me back to what it means to be fully alive, because keeping sorrow in also keeps joy and wonder out. We cannot live in full bloom without it. <clears throat> 